There's a free song over at Royal Academy of Dance headquarters at the moment. I'll tell you for why. For the first time in four years, the RAD's flagship event, the Fontaine, that's the Margot Fontaine International Ballet Competition, is taking place in person in London this October, in a shared physical space with real physical young dancers, a 3D human audience and actual coaches and choreographers. They've done great stuff in the virtual sphere, but everyone is excited for the return to the physical realm. The thing about the Fontaine is that it doesn't just showcase young dancers on the threshold of their professional career. It gives them a true development opportunity. There's a week of coaching and creating before they even take the stage with a crack team of top professionals. This year's coaches include Endelin T. Outlaw, dancer, educator, choreographer, dean of the School of Dance at the University of North Carolina. And she's today's guest on Why Dance Matters, the Royal Academy of Dance podcast. Endelin's career is incredibly varied. She performed with the Dance Theatre of Harlem and in the original Broadway cast of The Lion King. She's restaged ballets and developed a philosophy of dance teaching that's about more than killer technique, but focused on helping dancers bring their whole selves to the stage. Endelin T. Outlaw is also a really good name. I suspect there's a story there. A superhero name with a supersized sense of responsibility to young people. I can't wait to hear why dance matters to Endelin. Endelin, welcome to Why Dance Matters. I was really struck by something that you said in an interview when you became Dean of the School of Dance at the University of North Carolina. And you said that you wanted your students to become not only incredible technicians as dancers, but also good citizens of the world. And it's such a resonant phrase. I wondered, what does that mean to you to be a good citizen of the world? And why is it important in dance? Well, I think to be a good citizen in the world is to be someone who is actively listening and paying attention to the things that are going on around them in their immediate lives, but also on the broader spectrum. I think that that enhances and enriches their experiences, but also gives an opportunity for them to affect change in the world. And so I think good citizens are, are people who just care about what's going on on a larger circumference than just what is immediately impacting them in life. And I do think that that does resonate with who they become as artists. I know for me that being a good human, being a mindful human, caring about the world around me shaped my art and me becoming a ballerina far more than my being a ballerina shaped who I was as a human being. I think that the residue of our experiences really impact how we are perceived as artists on stage, that there's so much more to us than the visual that they're seeing, which is wonderful and which is why we train and work really hard and do the repetitive things that make us strong artists. But I think the human behind the artist is what takes you to that next level and resonates with an, a broad audience. And that's so interesting because it's easy, I think, in dance because it's so demanding, because it requires, as you say, all that work, all that practice, all that repetition, it must be quite easy sometimes to kind of cut yourself off from the wider world, to just have those blinkers on and 
to be a good citizen in the studio and on stage and and forget about the world. But I think best practices are just transferable skills. So I, I think if you if you come in as a person who has been taught to respect others, to embrace differences, to air towards kindness and believe in the positive as opposed to immediately thinking the other. I think that those things really do carry into the studio with you. And maybe there was a period and it it would be far back in my training and in my um, professional career where I did kind of adhere to the leave who you are at the door. Don't bring it into the studio. Um, I remember that being something that was often taught because there was a a certain desire for you to allow yourself to just be amused and lean into the transcendence of what it was we were ultimately trying to do on stage. But that I don't remember when that shifted. All I know is when the shift happened that for me, bringing my experiences with me enhanced everything that I did in the studio um, and was validated by starting to get roles and really being able to embrace them from a rich standpoint. And as an educator, is it easy to pass on those ethical qualities? Is it just by modelling them or do you design the way you teach so that it isn't just about steps, about technique, but is about that wider perspective? They really go hand in hand. I think it is most effective teaching students and learning yourself when it is a cyclical thing, that your actions what and what you say match one another. I often say, I don't want my statements to be my actions, but I want my actions to be my statement. If I live it, if I embody it, then I'm showing you what I'm also encouraging you to do, what's in my syllabi, so that you see it in real time and you see that it is not something that I'm just extending to you as an expectation. I'm showing and trying to live it, even as challenging as that can be at times. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons that we wanted to talk to you, Endelin, is because you're coming over to London later this year to coach at the Fontaine, the Royal Academy of Dances competition, the Margot Fontaine International Ballet Competition. And when you enter a room full of dancers who you've probably never met before and they have all the nerves of competition of wanting to do their best of being interested by a chance to be coached by you how do you calm the atmosphere or do you sort of work with that jangle of energy i don't know if i intentionally try to calm the atmosphere because i have always felt that i don't want to say nerves but an an energy of wanting to do well is indicative of care and of passion for what you do. But I do try to, again, model warmth and friendliness coupled with expectation. So expectancy and care. I think those two things can live together. I certainly want people to to want to be their best selves. But I do lead with your best self is enough whatever that is. You can only be you. No one else can be that. So that is where you start. And do you get an immediate sense when you meet a dancer for the first time of who they are, what they might need from you, what you might usefully give to them? Is that something that you can start tuning into quickly? I would say with some dancers, yes. I think some people are more open and curious or vulnerable. And I think that some have, just depending on their experience and not making judgment on it, have been maybe not prepared to let who they are be the thing that enters the room first or that starts the conversation of movement. I think many times we have to undo some of the notions of ballet in particular that you have to present a certain way. I don't always get a sense, but pretty quickly in, 
I think when she started to just talk with them and see if they are quick to respond and give opinions. I remember being a student that we weren't really encouraged to verbally express ourselves. And I think now we're encouraging students to have agency and autonomy and and voices and, and that their narratives can come from verbal expression just by them being in the room and then by the embodiment of stories of who they are. There's a, a real need for us to encourage those things to come out in students, but I think some are further along in that just naturally by personality, who they are, and others less so could be from any number of things. And Lynn, as a dancer, you were known, among other things, for your mighty leaps. We are going to be doing some mighty leaps of our own because otherwise this will be the world's longest podcast <laughs> <laughs> because there's too much to talk about. So, um, so the first leap I'm going to is, is back to childhood, actually, and the beginnings of your dance journey because you grew up in Chicago. Your parents were Baptist ministers. Mm-hmm. Were they wary of you embarking on a dance career? What did they expect for you? All right. So this is is all probably going to sound really, really cheesy. but um... (laughs) We are friends to the cheesy on this podcast. (laughs) You're at home here. (laughs) But I, so I'm the youngest of four siblings and I am seven years younger than my closest sibling. And they are stair steps. They were seven, eight, nine years older than me. So when I came along, I was definitely a surprise, let's just say. And I I like (laughs) to think that it was a pleasant surprise, or at least it it turned out to be a pleasant surprise. And as the last child in my family, and we were a family of very modest means, my mom, her favorite aunt, was concerned that after having me, she might have another series of children and, and and wanted her to name me end to me no more kids um no oh my goodness it's a true story and so my mom named the end of the line a play on end of the line indolent symbolizing you know that that's the end of this lineage of children and she didn't have any more but with that she poured into me all of the things that she had learned over her years of being a mother. Some of those things were about the arts. She became aware of Josephine Baker and of dance in general. And so I was really the benefactor of a mom who, through just reading and awareness, was ready to tap into my creativity. And so when I got on the table of one of her best friends, and started dancing to Tiny Tim's Tiptoe Through the Tulips, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't think I was crazy. They were like, ah, here's the dancer. This is that opportunity. <laughs> so they embraced it. That's delightful then. So you didn't have to stake a claim and argue your case. No, you could I didn't have just to just go full throttle. I was able to go yeah. full throttle. And that was quite a feat with two Baptist ministers who many of their colleagues thought that it was something that, I should not be allowed to do, you know, dancing on a Sunday. It was like the Sabbath day. How could you let her perform? But my parents really always expressed to me that they looked at it as a a gift and an anointing. We're talking already in this conversation, we've been talking about mentoring and being a mentor, having a mentor. Leaping forward a bit again, you joined the Dance Theatre of Harlem, where your mentor there was a legend, Arthur Mitchell. Arthur Mitchell was one of the greatest dancers of the 20th century. He founded the company. He was an extraordinary figure in dance. How was that experience in the studio and in the company? So that experience was incredible. Definitely formative years for me that really I'm so grateful for to this day. If I could jump back a little bit to before being in the studio with Arthur Mitchell and all the beautiful ballerinas who were in the company at that time, 
I moved to New York City to be an apprentice with the company in the early 80s. And I was young. I was 16 years old. And again, that leap of faith from my parents to allow me to move to New York City upon Mr. Mitchell's urging was quite rare. But it was only on the condition that I lived with his mother. So I stayed with his mother when I first got to New York City in the brownstone that was right down the street from Dan Sierra of Harlem. If he was a force, which he absolutely was, she <laughs> was a force. And she was a, she was a petite little woman, but boy, was she mighty. And boy, was she proud of Mr. Mitchell. And boy, did she have strong, strong ideas about what he would expect from me and, and what she expected from me. And so there was mentoring and there were standards that started at the homestead and carried over into the studio. And so being with him in the studio was certainly not easy all the time. And it certainly taught me grit. But what it definitely was, was informative in the way that you know someone cares and believes. And not only believes, but has expectations for you that he's not really going to accept you're not living up to. <laughs> I often say that he was, he was making us. He was like a master weaver. And he was making this great tapestry of artists and saw things in us that we hadn't yet realized in ourselves. And so sometimes he pushed. And if you didn't realize that that was pushing because he fully believed you were capable, it could be difficult. And I did go through a period of time when I would call my parents and say, I don't know if this is for me. I'm not getting any roles and he's tough on me all the time. And I just don't know if, if I can do this. And my mom, being one of my earliest mentors, she said something that I, I'll never forget and I often share with students today. She said, well, let me ask you this. Do you love what you're doing more than you loathe what you're doing? And I said, I do. And she said, well, then you push through and you find a way. And only when it becomes more toxic than it is joyful, do you make a shift. Your mother was wise. Wow, that is, that's an amazing piece of advice. And how did you find a way through? What did become your path? Those words galvanized me into saying, stop trying to be what you think Mr. Mitchell wants you to be or anyone else wants you to be. Do your best. Set your own goals with joy being one of the top goals. Keep enjoying what you're doing. That's why I started in the first place. So dance from a place of love. Challenge yourself in those ways. So I started just setting goals for myself and things just started opening up. I remember getting principal roles working with Fleming Ryberg. I was the first cast of Flower Festival, which is, you know, so deceptively hard. And Giselle, I was Merta and these roles that capitalize on that big jump that I have. But prior to that, I just couldn't seem to break through. But I think when people came in and I allowed them to either see me or not see me and stop trying so hard, that changed everything for me. It is amazing. Even those of us who aren't dancers will probably recognize that sense that sometimes the thing that is in your way is yourself. And you kind of almost need to get out of your own yes, way in order it. to be who you should be. That's right. That's so true. That wasn't really a question, but you know, I just, <laughs> just thought I'd share. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was a great observation. Um, when, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> When you began dancing, and especially in, in ballet, opportunities for dancers of colour must have seemed even more limited than they are today, and they're not always brilliant today. Where did you think your career would take you? Did you have a sense of what the future looked like? I really didn't. I trained primarily at Ruth Page School of Dance, in Chicago. Once I got serious about it, my very first school was Mayfair Academy of Fine Arts, 
which was started by a, a hoofer, Tommy Sutton. And I took ballet, gymnastics, and tap all in the, the span of an hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Pretty. <laughs> but it was um, one day that Chicago Ballet and the Ruth Page Productions, they were having auditions for Nutcracker. And I auditioned and I got in that I then transitioned into training at Ruth Page School of Dance. And I was always one of two people of color in in the studio, in the space. And in some ways, I was so young that I didn't understand what I was feeling, that it was isolation and that there was a bit of a why is this art form that I love so much not in love with me? It took me a minute to, to kind of understand those things. And and so, yeah, it, it was hard. And I didn't know where it would end up. But I had talent. And I did get scholarships to study at Joffrey Ballet in Pennsylvania, School of Ballet, and other places. So opportunities kept arising, even with the challenges. So I stayed in. And then I remember very clearly... American Ballet Theater used to come to Chicago to perform at the Auditorium Theater. And the company dancers would take with Ruth Page, uh, with Larry Long. Barisha Koff would take class with us. And one day he saw me in class and he pulled me over after class and asked who I was and what I was intending to do in the summer. He said he wanted me to come and train at ABT. Boy, did that change so many things in terms of dynamic among other students who didn't necessarily always treat me so kindly. And that's not all of them, but some were a little elusive and a little distant. After that, things shifted quite a lot. I ended up not ever going for reasons that's a long story, but Dance Theater Harlem also came to Chicago and Larry Long took myself and the other two dancers of color at that time to take company class with them. He offered them apprenticeships because they were older than I was at that time and wanted me to come and train there for the summer, which I did. And so seeing all of those beautiful brown ballerinas on stage doing Corsair and doing the classics, I think that was the moment where I thought, okay, well, there is a place for me in this in this art form. And one of the things that is really lovely as you speak is that because dance and ballet, they are careers of hard knocks and opportunities that don't always come your way and relentless criticism. Sometimes it's part of the teaching process. I don't get a sense that that led you to doubt yourself or to doubt your talent. You sound quite secure in that. Again, I think it dampened my love and my joy of it for a while. Not so much to doubt my talents. And I do think that was because of a really strong support system in my parents and in my siblings too, as well. I didn't doubt it. I think I just started to realize I'm going to have to create some yeses. <laughs> you know, I can't, I, can't wait for, I can't wait for all yeses. There, there are far more no's. So I'm going to have to be creative in, in how I get this done. Yeah, so it, it taught me permeability. It taught me creativity. It, it allowed me to tap into trying to see other ways that I could shine on the just in case, you know. <laughs> It's time for another mighty leap. We're heading to Broadway. It blows my mind that moves that you first danced in the original cast of The Lion King are still performed today by countless dancers across the world, probably dancers who don't necessarily have a sense of the people who were in the room when they were creating those steps originally. It's an astonishing thought. When you were part of The Lion King, did you feel that you were involved in something that would have such a long life? I absolutely did. (laughs) 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 
<laughs> and not because of not because of, of my role in it, but because of the collective from Julie Taymor, who just recently spent time here at UNCSA with our students and is just an incredible role model for women who are in forms where they are the minority. Her representation of, again, having a sense of who and what it is she knows will be successful and what it will take, what sacrifices may have to happen in order for those things that she knows are integral to a successful production to take place. She is an incredible mentor of mine, whether she knows it or not. But that, I think, it started at the top. Her manner, her belief, her extreme amount of research and respect for the cultures and the details from the fabrics and the prints in them all having meaning and being specifically chosen. All of those things were indicators that this is going to be something special because there is real care going into the creation of it. Nothing was done in a haphazard or just a throw it in there kind of manner. Working with Garth Fagan and, and PJ Penningwell and Natalie, again, the work that they put into creating concert like movement in this Broadway production elevated the level of the artistry within this really accessible story that people knew from this animated movie. So I did know that it was going to be a success because they just put together an incredible team of people from the creative team to the artist. I mean, people like Karine Plantandi, other dancers from Ailey, um, and all of the, the singers from South Africa and the U.S. It, it's incredible voices, incredible movers. And is it a very different discipline, especially when you've come from a, a repertory company like Dance Theatre of Harlem, to suddenly have to perform the same piece night after night, several nights a week, several afternoons a week, for weeks, months at a time. Is that a very different sort of discipline? It is. It really is. And I would love to be able to tell you as the dean of a school where I would want everyone to always think that professionalism is something that <laughs> must always be at the forefront. <laughs> there are times, and, and particularly coming from a concert dance world, where there were so many different ballets in our repertoire and so many different roles to play, where going into a, a production where after a certain point, they consider it frozen. And what you do on stage is to aim to do things exactly the way you did it the previous time. That for an artist and someone who likes to experience and experiment with newness and nuance, that was really quite challenging. So it was a, a type of discipline and stamina that you had to find. How do you keep it new within yourself so that the person in the audience who's seeing it for the first time is not being shortchanged? And again, was it easy to hold on to the joy of performance in the middle of a long run? I, I think sometimes the fatigue got to you. The joy came in the community that was built in that group of people. I mean, we were really, really close and really supportive of one another. And we laughed together and we did things outside of performances and productions. We really felt a sense of being a family. And when one person maybe needed to be lifted up, we literally did circle dances and we created skits and celebrated people in song and, and rap and we dressed up and we made each other laugh and smiled. And so we found ways to keep freshness a part of our experience, even if it didn't happen on the stage, if we had to honor being consistent in what we did. And another strand of your work is restaging dance, recreating it. It's such an interesting discipline, that one, because it's not like a musical score. It's not like a play text where <laughs> it's written down. There's notation, there's film, but holding on and 
communicating the spirit of a piece of dance is ever so tricky. How do you do it? It really is tricky. And I think it really is an honor. It's an honor to be able to impart your knowledge of someone else's work onto new bodies who should feel like once it is given to them that it is equally an honor to be able to perform that with the history of it informing the movement, but also with the freedom and license to be able to bring who they are into the role. So it is a bit tricky, but I've, I've always enjoyed it. I think one of the things I love so much about concert dance is that my brain allowed me to be able to learn works quickly and retain them. So restaging is something that comes naturally to me and being able to give some background information with the steps. So the why as much as the what is very important to me when restaging works. And is there that muscle memory kicking in as soon as you hear the music, your body starts responding? Yes, very much so. And it's a great feeling. You forget that you're going to regret it later, that you've, you've shown so much of it. <laughs> 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 because the muscle memory is, is quite real. And yeah, it's like time kind of ceases and and you're right back there doing it but then you know the reality is is your your body does not respond the same way as it used to but in that moment yeah it's incredible that the mind can be just as fresh and visualize and then be able to impart that information so clearly <laughs> And that's really funny because, I mean, we we all say as we grow older, oh, I still feel 18 inside. Right. And you still you still feel like an 18-year-old dancer I do, inside. I do. And, and, and my body, and I'm knocking on, on wood, my body actually can still do a lot of the things. And in some ways, there are things that were more challenging when I was younger that are easier now because of that removed pressure of doing it for someone. It's just, again, it's like letting the body take over, getting out of your own way, the nerves that add tension to your pirouettes or your chenilles, where now it's just such a liberating thing because I'm doing it because I'm showing it and I'm sharing. And we're taking one of our last leaps, taking you to your current role at the University of North Carolina. And you took up your post in 2021. It is it is an interesting moment for dance, isn't it? In terms of the conversations we're having about diversity, about the mental health crisis that was really heightened by the pandemic, about the dance industry as a place for a healthy career. And those are conversations that even a decade ago weren't being had publicly. And so I guess it's good that they are. But how do you reflect on, on where we are now? I see where we are as being a place of, I don't want to say pause, but I think it's a place of awareness and again, an opportunity where actions really can happen, but we need to really act now and stop speaking about things either anecdotally or even in theory. Now is the time for us to make more opportunities for diverse dancers, not just in terms of race, but aesthetics and gender, to be able to open up our art form and our companies for those possibilities. I think it will only enrich the discipline that we all love so much. I think it will allow audiences and future dancers to see themselves represented. And I think that the more normalized we make it, the better it will be, particularly in ballet. We still have work to do on leveling out the hierarchy and making it a demystified form where people can't see themselves. And it doesn't have to be in 
narratives. It just has to be in accessibility. Make it available to people to do and to see. And it must be satisfying to be in a leadership position where you can, as we say, be the change that you want to see. You can enact strategy. You can make things happen. It is. It's incredibly rewarding. It's challenging. I leave work sometimes with an enormous smile on my face. And then I get home and I pass out because it it is one of those things where I'm sure you've heard, leave it all on the stage. I think that the stage of change requires a lot of leaders. You have to think of how you can make change in a way that does not feel abrupt, disrespectful of tradition, and also that truly does do the thing that you are trying to have it do. And when I say that, when you think of equity and when you think of inclusion, it it shouldn't be one group feeling more included by another group feeling less so. When I say I want to be an advocate for inclusion, that's for every single one of my students regardless of the color of their skin. So that may mean their height. That may mean many other things. And inclusion sometimes is celebrated in making space for a group to shine, but not exclusive of other people being welcomed into those spaces or into those opportunities. Like, for example, we will be doing our winter dance is a main stage performance that happens in February every year here. This coming February, our winter dance will be the first celebration of Black History Month with all choreographers of color. But that does not mean that all of our students won't be dancing and performing and participating. It's open and welcome to everyone. It's a learn about and and experience this with me, not separate from me. I can't help but feel that for the young dancers in the Fontaine, it's going to be a wonderful experience to be in the studio with someone who approaches what she does with such thoughtfulness and such care. What are you hoping that they will take from the experience of working with you? Well, first of all, thank you for that. I'm just really excited to be in the studio with them Everything that I've done in my career has been special and joyful to me. And I understand what my role and responsibility as dean and a leader in admin is now. But the studio and being in conversation with students and student artists, that's my happy place. So I'm hoping that what they'll take from me is that you have people who don't want to change you or try to fit you into a box or be something that you're not. We want you to be your best self and discover that along with us. We want to give you the tools to discover that, not discover it for you. So as a coach, I just want to give them the space to find the things that they need within themselves to elevate what it is they're going to present when they are performing. Gwendolyn, it's just been a, such a pleasure to speak to you, but I am now going to, with one last leap, release you <laughs> into the world. <laughs> but with the final question, which is, why does dance matter to you? Gosh, um, and I I was prepared for this question, but it's, it's, um, it's a hard one to answer without really feeling emotional about it. I'll preface with saying that Arthur Mitchell said so many things over the course of my time with him that resonated. One of those things was that as dance artists, we represent something larger than ourselves. And that 
to me, really stuck with me because dance is something that I feel is a right. It's innately all of ours. You put on music and you see a young child start to move. And so anything that is an instant response matters. Anything that we have ownership and claim of matters. It can indicate joy. It can indicate catharsis. It it gives us an opportunity to express without words and access sometimes things that we can't really talk about. Dance has been a part of major movements in our lifetime. So it matters because it is another way for us to be in conversation, to be heard and to be seen. Wonderful. That is a beautiful final leap. Endelin, I was about to say something really cheesy about how we'd reached the end of the line, but honestly... <laughs> You've clearly got so much more you you want to do and are going to do <laughs> so much ahead that I won't say that, but I will say for now, thank you so much for being our guest on thank Why you. Dance Matters. Thank you so much. When I logged on to record this episode today, Endelin was already deep in conversation with our producer, Sarah, talking work-life balance, talking pets. She doesn't have them, but she's more of a dog person. Thank you for asking. Even before we began, it was clear that she was warm, empathetic, brimming with ideas. And I hope that comes over in the chat you've just heard. Endelin will soon be heading to London for The Fontaine, and our show notes have links to her work and The Fontaine, which takes place in October. The final is on Sunday the 29th of October at His Majesty's Theatre in London's West End. That's the one that's the home of the Phantom of the Opera. And tickets are still available. And we'd be thrilled if you could subscribe, like or review the podcast so that people who might enjoy Why Dance Matters can find us. Our guest today was Endelin T. Outlaw. Why Dance Matters is made by the RAD team of Neve Carey Furness, Keisha Dodd and Katie Hagen. And our artwork is by Bex Glendening. And our producer and resident superhero is Sarah Miles. I'm David Jays. Take care and see you soon. <laughs> <laughs>